You know, when we need help and we ask for help and God sends somebody to bring help into our life, not only are we blessed, but the person that helps us is also blessed. And equally true, when we need help and we don't ask for help, we deprive somebody else the opportunity to bring blessing into our lives and we deprive them of that blessing. So we're going to talk today about help. And we're going to be looking at a story in the Gospel of Mark of an individual who cried out for help to God and how God helped him. First of all, I want to say welcome to any of you that are here uh, for the very first time. You're an honored guest here at Trinity. We are absolutely blessed to have you. I want to welcome those that are watching live video streaming and those that are in our chapel venue. It's good to have all of you here. Are you all ready for school to start? You know, Texas Tech starts tomorrow. All the students going back. What, LCU and some of the other universities? Are you all, you're not ready for it, I guess, huh? Okay. All right. It's here, right? Look to your neighbor and say, it's here. Parents, how many of you are glad school already started, right? Okay. <laughs> we got some happy parents. Great. Uh, there's never been a, a greater time to be alive if you are in need of help and be able to get that help. I mean, technology allows us to ask for help and to receive help like never before. Take, for example, my youngest son, JT, and a couple of his friends a few weeks ago, they went to the Pecos Wilderness to go backpacking. And, uh, you know, I was confident these are young men, sharp, smart. They knew where they were going. They had their maps. They had their food. They had their water purification. They had everything that they needed. But as a dad, there was one thing they were lacking. I went out and I invested in a personal locator beacon device. <laughs> now, why did I do that? Because of all the I shouldn't be alive shows I've seen, it went really bad for people because they couldn't call for help, right? So I, I went out and got it for him, told him to set it up. He set it up just in case. Now, they didn't need it, but just in case, if they needed to be able to call for help, I wanted them to be able to call for help. But you know, when it comes to asking for help, Americans aren't very good at asking for help. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, we are rugged individualism, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps mentality. We hesitate to ask for help when we need it. But the story that we're going to look at in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, is the story of a guy by the name of Bartimaeus. And he was unashamed when he needed help to ask God for help and it resulted in a miracle in his life let's go to mark's gospel chapter 10 we're going to be in reading in verse 46 and here's what the word of the lord says and so they reached jericho later as they left town a great crowd was following and now it happened that a blind beggar named bartimaeus the son of timaeus was sitting beside the road as jesus was going by when Bartimaeus heard that Jesus from Nazareth was near, he began to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Shut up, some of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted the louder again and again, Oh, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped there in the road and said tell him to come here so they called the blind man you lucky fellow they said come on he's calling you Bartimaeus yanked off his old coat flung it aside jumped up and came to Jesus what do you want me to do for you Jesus asked oh teacher the blind man said I want to see and Jesus said to him, all right, it's done. Your faith has healed you. And instantly, the blind man could see and followed Jesus down the road. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this incredibly amazing true story. We thank you, Lord, for the spiritual truths that are just going to uh, explode out of this story into our hearts and minds this day. Father, I thank you for every person that's here and those within the sound of my voice. And I thank you that not one will be deprived to receive the truth that the Holy Spirit wants to pinpoint into each of our hearts with accuracy. I pray and ask your grace and blessing now in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. Now, most of us in here have probably seen those really 
cheesy commercials on television. You know the one where there is a really bad actor, actress lying on the floor saying, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. These are the most hilarious commercials out there. Why? Because they're so cheesy and the acting is so terrible. Matter of fact, the sappy, mellow, dramatic way in which the actress says that phrase, help, I've fallen and I can't get up, has become a catchphrase as popular as the old Wendy's commercial, where's the beef, all right? Now, these commercials are hilarious, but we also know that the service that this device provides is no laughing matter. I mean, it actually does help people uh, in their hour of need. Matter of fact, my mother is 76. She lives on her own in Albuquerque. She still works in fairly good health. But she has this device that when she's at home, she has hanging around her neck. And it, it brings me some peace and comfort that in the event of an emergency, she can push that button and hopefully somebody will respond. But you know, Americans, we're just not very prone to ask for help, except in dire circumstances, like if you're drowning at sea. Then you'll cry out, for help. There was a book that was written by Nora Claver, and the title of the book is Mayday, Asking for Help in Times of Need. And she did extensive research, and she discovered that Americans just aren't comfortable asking for help. Whether it's, you know, getting on a plane and, and you're trying to get your luggage in the overhead bin, so the rest of us that have already done that and we're seated and we want the plane to take off, you can't get it in there. And, you know, we're, we're so hesitant to say, hey, can, can you give me a, a helping hand? Or maybe, you know, you're on the, stranded on the side of the road and you have a flat and, uh, you know, somebody wants to stop and says, hey, do you need a helping hand? I got it. I got it. We're so, we're so prone to do that. And she did some research and she discovered there are several reasons why Americans don't ask for help. I want to share a few of those with you uh, this morning. First of all, uh, we're never taught to ask for help in her research. She said, we have few role models and in, in, in examples of asking for help. Many of us, our grandparents, who were part of the greatest generation, they were not very prone to ask for help. Uh, they had a, a, a work ethic. They, they were very self-sufficient. And you didn't ask for help. You just you got it done. Uh, the second reason she lists in her book is that we love our independence. Uh, in a famous book, uh, called Bowling Alone, The Collapse of Revival in American Community. Uh, the author of this book uh, revealed how Americans are becoming more and more isolated. Uh, we are no longer a part of community, club, gatherings, organizations, or even church. And in the advent of the internet, I mean, why do you need to go to a store to buy something? Just there, it's a few clicks away. Right? You can basically do everything that you need to do over the internet, so why have to bother to get involved in the lives of other people? You can even go to school uh, at home uh, over the internet. The next reason she lists is we don't think to ask. Uh, Claver says that we've been so brainwashed by the American ethic of self-sufficiency that asking for help just never comes to mind. We're so focused on caring for ourselves that we don't even realize that we need help. But once again, when we need help and we don't ask God for help, we deprive someone that God wants to send into our life to offer us that help. And in so doing, they are blessed and we are blessed. And so when we need help and we're not asking for help, we're actually stealing somebody, else, somebody else's blessing. Uh, the next example is it's easier to do it ourselves. There's an idiom that we Americans have popularized. If you want something done, if you want it done right, do it yourself. Uh, so we don't want to be indebted to anybody else, so we don't ask for help from anybody else. And then the final reason is we're afraid to ask, right? We're afraid of what asking for help might say about us. Uh, we'd rather die a thousand deaths than have someone else think that we can do things, that we can't do things on our own. So in short, uh, we're not very good at asking for help. But the reality is, at times, we're not very good at getting things done on our own. Uh, we accept achieving modest results instead of getting real help and making real progress in our lives. And then we miss out on the gifts that God has blessed somebody else with 
to offer us the help that we need. You see, God's in the helping business. Uh, the old saying, God helps those who can't help themselves, is not good theology. The reality is God helps those who can't help themselves. And God helps those who can't help themselves so that they can receive that help so in return they can in, in return pay it forward and help somebody else who might be in need. What I love about the story of Bartimaeus that we read here in Mark's Gospel chapter 10 is here's an individual that didn't hesitate in crying out to God for help. And there's some incredible lessons that he can teach us today about what it means to look to God for help. His story is a story of faith, it's a story of hope, it's a story of healing. That, cannot, that was not only a story that played out in his life, but it's a story that can play out in our life if, when we're in help, we ask for help. You know, as a church, we're in the helping business uh, because God's in the business of helping hurting people. And whether it's our outreach center, the Trinity Outreach Center on 34th and Flint, we have a 1,000 people every month, a 1,000 people every month that need help, that find themselves at a particular season in their life where they need help, and a 1,000 people every month walk through that door, and our staff and incredible volunteers are there to lend a helping hand. We provide clothing, we provide food, we provide prayer, and we provide a way out. That's the help that we're able to offer. At our new location of our Heartline Women's Clinic, right there on Broadway, just a couple of blocks from Texas Tech University, our staff and those that volunteer in the ministry that's going on there at Heartline, when a woman finds herself in an hour of tremendous need and doesn't know where to turn, she can walk through those doors and there is a helping hand that's lovingly and compassionately extended to that woman in her hour of need and we have the wherewithal to provide that woman with the help that she needs because God is in the helping business. Can we thank the Lord for that church family? You know, whatever ministry that we offer here at Trinity, we offer that ministry as a resource to help, right? Because all of us have been at a place of great need at some point in time in our life, and all of us at some point in time will find ourselves in a place of great need. So we have developed and devised ministries here at Trinity Church to provide a lending, a helping hand uh, to those that find themselves in an area of need, whether you're in college and you simply need a helping hand of encouragement and positive relationships in your life. We have a ministry for young adults here at Trinity. Uh, whether you're a woman or you're a man and you need personalized ministry from our women's ministry or men's ministry, we have those ministries uh, available. We have a ministry called Freedom Ministries. And Freedom Ministries is to help people that need freedom in an area of their life or you want to maintain freedom. Uh, in Christ in an area of your life. And so those that may be going through a time or season of loneliness or hurting or, or maybe struggling with some addiction or whatever the case might be, this ministry, those who are part of this ministry, they extend and lend a helping hand to those that are in need. And so my plea to all of us today is, if you're in need of help, ask for that help. And if you're at a place in your life where you have been helped, now get involved so that you can return help to others who, are in, who find themselves in an hour of need. If you need uh, a fee base, we have, we have free based ministries, ministries that you don't have to pay anything for. Uh, we have marriage, what's called marriage toolbox. We have marriage mentors. We have family matters group. We have marriage prep group for those that may be struggling in their marriage right now. We want to provide a lending helping hand to you in your hour of need. We have free base ministries here, but we also have a fee based ministry, our counseling ministry. We have, an, we have a licensed counselor on staff that is available. You can call and make an appointment. And so whatever help you need, Whatever, at whatever level of, of, of that need is in your life, we want to provide that help. Now, listen, if we have, a, if, if there's a need that you see or a need in your life that maybe we as a church aren't meeting, I've got a great idea. Find somebody else that is as passionate about addressing this need that you see that's unmet, that you feel called by God to meet, meet with one of our pastors. And as long as it aligns with our vision, our mission, and our values, then you and that other person, we are a permission-giving church, go make it happen.
right? Because we believe that God's in the need meeting business and if he's met a need in your life that now you are passionate about and want to help others find and meet that need by God's grace then let's get busy and let's lend that helping hand because when we help somebody else not only are they blessed but we the one that's giving the help is also blessed so that takes us back to our story of Bartimaeus you know uh, as I was studying for this message and, and usually the way it works is I know a week or two or three in advance what I'm going to be preaching on, unless it's a series, then I know, of course, the theme of that series. And I usually study the week leading up to that weekend that I'll be preaching the message. That's when I do my most intense studying for that message. That's when it's going to be the freshest. That's when it's, you know, going to be just in my heart, and it's, you know, it's going to be where it needs to be so that I could deliver that message to our congregation. So as I was studying this past week for this week's message, and I was going over this section of scripture. Uh, I go through all my commentaries. I do the research. I do, the, I do all the reading. I, I, I gain as much understanding of the text and the context and the history and, and any particular Greek words uh, or Hebrew words if I'm studying out of the Old Testament that I think are going to be relevant. And then I, I put it all together and sort it out and put it in a 35-minute message because after 35 minutes, you're ready to go. And so I've got to condense it all. So I'm like taking stuff out. I'm like, oh, this is so good. I'll preach it another time. Oh, but I got to share this, but, but I got to condense it down. So sometimes it happens real easy that I, I read through a text and all of a sudden three points have just come to the surface. It's not usually that easy. But as I was studying this section of scripture, three points immediately. I just thank the Holy Spirit when things like this happen, right? Immediately three amazing points came to the surface and I'm going to share those three points with you um, they're called the cry the criticism and the calling so let's look at point number one the cry the cry in our story came from a guy by the name of Bartimaeus now who was Bartimaeus well we really don't know but what we do know is that he was a blind beggar which meant this at the time of Christ if you were a beggar you were the lowest of the low not in the eyes of God because everyone's precious in the eyes of God but in the eyes of society, if you were a beggar, you were the lowest of the low. And if you were a blind beggar, you couldn't get any lower than that. So that's really the only detail that we know about Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. We don't know if he was married. I hope he was married. I hope he had an expression of joy and happiness in his life through marriage. Uh, we don't know if he had children. I hope he had children. I hope he had, you know, the expression of joy uh, and that blessing in his life. But we don't know that for sure. But here's what we do know. We know he was a blind beggar. And we know that every day somebody escorted him to this particular road, to this particular spot in the road. And every day of his life, his entire life consisted from sunup to sundown begging for bread, begging for alms. That was the only way he could subsist is by the charity of others. And on this particular day, this blind beggar, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, heard something. He heard the gospel. He heard the good news. He heard that Jesus of Nazareth was walking down that very road where he was seated and where he was begging. He heard that Jesus was close by and in the vicinity. You see, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is hearing the good news about Jesus. There's a verse of scripture in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was walking down that road and faith rose up inside of his heart. And he thought to himself, if Jesus is near, if Jesus is here, he can fix what's going on in my life. So he heard, and faith came, and so what did he do? He began to cry out. He began to shout to get Jesus' attention. And here's this blind bear. Can you see him sitting on the side of the road, and all of a sudden, he begins to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Can we do that together? Can I just get in the role of Bartimaeus this morning? Are you ready? He's like, it's too early for me to shout. No, it's not too early. Here we go. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Wow. And he shouted it, and he had no uh, hesitation, no embarrassment, because he wanted to get Jesus' attention. And matter of fact, 
as he was shouting it out, we know, we know the people around him, they begin to shout back at him. But why was Bartimaeus shouting? I mean, was he practicing primal therapy, or as some call it, scream therapy? There is a form of psychotherapy that people believe that you have, we have these repressed feelings in our lives that were placed there at childhood, and that the only way to really process those repressed feelings is to yell and scream at the top of your voice at your mom and dad and how wrong they were, right? Well, I don't know if that stuff works. So I know it wasn't primal therapy, but he was shouting. And when others around him told him to be quiet, he shouted even louder. Now, how many of you know that if you've ever been to an athletic sporting event, people go crazy at those events? I mean, I remember when my kids played t-ball, right? I couldn't believe the parents watching their little kids playing t-ball, yelling at the top of their lungs. I was one of them. <laughs> and then when it became pitch, right, uh, when it became pitch ball, and there was actually an umpire, and he was calling strikes. I'm like, dude, where are your glasses? That wasn't a strike. I'm like, you're the pastor of Trinity Church, you know. <laughs> what if somebody recognizes you, right? I mean, so there are times, appropriate times in our life, that we shout. Now, how many know that we're, we're hoping the Red Raiders give us plenty of reasons this season yeah. to shout? Yeah? To shout? And not at the referees, Right? But, but, but to, uh, to shout. Did you know that shouting is actually biblical? I know some people are like real uncomfortable with, with you know, raising their voice at, at all, especially in church. Like, shh, we're in church. I grew up like that. Shh, shh. What? We're in church. Shh. Listen, I'm going to go to sleep. I mean, the guy's boring up there. You know what I'm talking about? I was at, uh, I was at, I was at the the grocery store several weeks ago, a couple few months ago actually, and uh, this very nice mom and her, her daughter came up and she said, my daughter really enjoyed your, your message this weekend. I said, great, because you know, I really don't care what adults think about my preaching, but if a young person likes my preaching, I know I'm, 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 I'm anointed, right? And she's about 12, and she said, my daughter just loved your message. I said, that's great, that's awesome. She said, she said you got your point across today without raising your voice. And I thought, what service was she in? Because like every service, I raise my voice. I mean, I try not to. You know, I try to come like real cool, cool, cool calm, and collected. And, you know, kind of want to put my religious tone on. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God. Please turn with me in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 10. Man, I just can't do it that way. I mean, when you're up here and you actually feel what you're preaching, and you're actually passionate about what you're preaching, I mean, you can't help but get excited, right? And then I realize that in the Bible, shouting is, is like biblical. Look at Psalm 47, verse 1, and I want us to read this verse out loud together. Psalm 47, verse 1. Here we go. Oh, clap your hands, all ye peoples. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. What does it say to do? Shout to God with a voice of triumph. So shouting is biblical. Now, notice it doesn't say shout at God. You better not be shouting at God. But you want to shout to God. Husbands, you never want to shout at your wife. You want to shout to your wife, I love you! You're awesome! Right? Parents, you don't want to shout at your kids. You want to shout to your kids, get up for the last time! You're going to be late for school, right? So we're to shout not at God, but we're to shout to God. How many know that at the end of any kind of sporting event, those who win are the ones doing the shouting? I mean, I mean, no matter what it is, whether it's an individual sporting event or a team sporting event, at the end of a significant game where you end up the winner, you're like, yeah, right? You're like, we're triumphant. Well, as Christians, sometimes it may not look that way. Sometimes it may not feel that way. Sometimes it may seem like the world is against you and all the circumstances of life are against you, but all you need to do is go to the back of the book and the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and you realize one thing, God wins and God's people win and we are triumphant and we are victorious and so we can shout with a voice of triumph. 
You know, uh, there's a story of uh, Joshua, the book of Joshua, and when God commanded him to go in, into the promised land, the very, first, the very first kingdom, the very first city that they had to conquer was Jericho, and Jericho was tightly shut up. There was a wall built around Jericho. And this is before Donald Trump came on the scene. You know what I'm talking about. There, and it was impenetrable, right? And nobody thought this wall could come down, but God told his people, I want you to march seven times around that wall for seven days, and on the seventh day, seven times, and at the end of marching around that city wall, seven times on the seventh day, what did they do? They shouted, and the walls came crumbling down. Wow. And then Israel, in, in the story of 1 Samuel 4, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought back into the city, the people of God shouted a praise to God, and it was as though there was an earthquake, and the earth shook. And then, in my daily devotion, reading through the Bible in a year, I was reading through uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it talks about uh, when the Lord returns at the rapture for the church, and it says in verse uh, 16 that the Lord will descend with a shout. Oh, how many of you are waiting, waiting for that shout? I can't wait to hear that shout. Woo, that's going to be an awesome shout, right? So shouting is scriptural. Matter of fact, there was this little boy. He was uh, doing his bedtime prayers. His mom was right next to him, and he was praying. And all of a sudden, about halfway through his prayer, he started yelling. He started screaming. He said, and God, you know I've been a very good boy, and my birthday's coming up, and I really want that red bicycle. And his mom said, son, son, you don't have to yell. God's not deaf. He goes, I know, but Grandma is, is deaf, and she's in the next room. <laughs> you see, this little boy knew how to get his prayers answered. You know, actually, as I studied this, did you know shouting at appropriate times in an appropriate way can do at least four things for your life? First of all, shouting can focus your faith. I believe that Bartimaeus was shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, not only to get the Lord's attention, because the Lord knew that day, because he knows everything, that there was a man he was going to heal by the name of Bartimaeus as he walked down that road on his way to Jerusalem. So it was really more for Bartimaeus to focus his faith in really anything else. The second thing I believe it does is shouting at appropriate times can mute your doubts and your fears. It can mute your doubts and your fears. The third thing is I believe there are appropriate times when you and I are to shout to God with the voice of triumph and to the circumstances of our life because it intensifies your resolve. It intensifies your resolve. I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about the movie Braveheart. And I thought about that scene where Mel Gibson, you know, was trying to rally his fellow Scotman to fight the English. And I thought, what if he never raised his voice? What if he said, fight and you may die, run and you will live at least a while, and dine in your bed many years from now? Would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that day for one chance, just one chance, to come back as young men and to tell our enemies, you may take our lives, but you will never take our freedom. What a boring movie that would have been, right? And what a, what a worthless battle that would have been. Or at the end of the movie, they're torturing him, right? And the final thing that comes out of his mouth, freedom! Yeah, you're like, that's the way to end a movie. That's the way to end your life. That's the way to go with gusto. If it's your last breath, yell it out, freedom, right? I mean, what he would have said, freedom. <laughs> oh, no. We wouldn't have paid to go see the movie, right? So it, it intensifies your resolve. And the fourth thing it does, and I believe this is true, it intimidates Satan. You see, when you and I get really on fire for Jesus, and, and I'm not talking about empty emotion or emotionalism, but I'm talking about real faith and the expression of that faith through our lives. When we get serious for God and we go all out for God, the world is going to get really uncomfortable with that. You see, Bartimaeus shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I don't think it was simply to get the attention of Jesus. I believe that Bartimaeus, his entire life, the world has been screaming at him. For his entire life, the circumstances of life have been yelling at him, you're worthless, you're no good, you're a loser, you're a blind beggar. Do you hear me? You're a blind beggar. That's all you are. That's all you will ever be. Do any of you have voices like that that have been shouting at you maybe your entire life, telling you who you aren't? who you can't be, who you will never be, or yelling at you who you are in the, in the way the world defines who you are. And maybe this was Bartimaeus' 
breakthrough moment. It was the breaking moment in his life where he said, enough is enough, and I want to silence all the negative voices that have been screaming at my life all of my life. Now it's my time. Now it's my turn to shout. And he began to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Wow. And then what happened? After he cried out, the criticism came. Because, see, the world, the flesh, and the devil will always criticize when you begin to express your true worship and your true faith in Christ because the world wants you to shut up. The translation that we read out of the, uh, the uh, Living Bible, it says that they turned to him, the crowd did, and they said, shut up. Don't you know the world is telling Christians and has been telling the Christians now for 2,000 years, when we begin to declare that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, and we begin to proclaim the truth of who Jesus Christ is, the world looks at you and says, shut up. But like Bartimaeus, we need to take our cue from him. As there were those that day telling him to shut up, what did he do? He got a little louder and a little bolder, and he said over and over again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You know, the world just gets really uptight when you start mentioning the name of Jesus. Jesus. Let's just say that together. Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. And it wasn't just any Jesus. I'm sure there were a lot of Jesuses in that day, right? Like we got quite a few Jesuses in, that, in, in our days, and that's good. That's a great name, right? But this wasn't just any Jesus. This was Jesus of Nazareth. This was the Jesus of Nazareth who was a blind eye opener, deaf ear unstopper, dead body raiser. This is the Jesus who could walk on water. This was the Jesus who could multiply the fish and the loaves. This was the Jesus who could command legions of demons to come out of people's lives and set them free. This is the Jesus that created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. For God created all things through him, for him, and in him. This is the Jesus that Bartimaeus said is coming my way, walking down the very road where I am seated today. And this is the Jesus that I must get his attention because I know he could change everything in my life. And you know what? Bartimaeus had good theology too. You know why? Because notice how he called out to the Lord. He said, Jesus, which is Yeshua, it's the Hebrew version of the name Jesus is Joshua. Salvation is of the Lord. He knew exactly who he was. He said, Yeshua, and then he called him son of David. That's one of many titles in the Bible for Jesus. Son of David, Bartimaeus as a Jew understood that Jesus was the promised coming king of the dynasty of David, that according to the the, the kingly uh, lineage, Jesus was the son of David, which means he was the heir to the throne, which means he was the king. And so Bartimaeus had awesome theology. He said, Yeshua, son of David, you are the promised Messiah. Have mercy upon me. Come on, can we thank the Lord for who Jesus is? And then the third point, there's the, the cry, the criticism, and then the calling. The calling. When Jesus heard Bartimaeus call out to him. The Bible says in verse 49, when Jesus heard him, he stopped there in the road. He stopped there in the road, and he said, tell him to come here. The question I have for you today, what causes God to stop in the middle of the road and give you and me his undivided attention? That's what's happening in this story, and I love it. Jesus is about 18 miles from Jerusalem. This is the, these are the final days of the life and ministry of Jesus on the earth. Jesus is walking with his disciples to Jerusalem where he will die for the sins of the world. This is the last recorded miracle of Jesus before his death on the cross for all of us. And so I'm sure Jesus had a lot on his mind. I'm sure he had a burden that he was carrying upon his life for what he was about to face in Jerusalem. And he's walking. The Bible says he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem. But on his way there, all of a sudden, he stops dead in his tracks. I love that. What causes God? 
to stop dead in his tracks and give you his undivided attention. It's the cry of faith, and it's the cry of mercy. Basically, Bartimaeus was saying, Help! I've fallen, and I can't get up. And it wasn't in a cheesy way either. See, that's what makes the power of God real in our lives. When we admit we can't do it on ourselves. We have failed time and time again, and we will continue to fail time and time again. Because Christianity is not about you trying harder and harder. It's not about how hard you can work. It's about God's amazing grace. It's about his mercy. And it happened to me 35 years ago, January 1st, 1980, when I had fallen because of sin and I couldn't get up. And I cried out to Jesus and I said, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Jesus stopped in his tracks on that road of sin, on that road to hell, on that road to destruction that I, find my, I found myself on. And Jesus stopped and called me unto himself and showed me his grace and showed me his mercy and opened my spiritual eyes. You see, my friend, there are three types of blindness in the Bible. There's physical blindness mentioned in the Bible. And Bartimaeus was physically blind. But there's also intellectual blindness. And there's spiritual blindness. Isaiah said to, his, to God's people, you have eyes to see, but you can't see. Ears to hear, but you can't hear. Hearts to perceive, but you can't perceive. You're blind spiritually. You know, that day, Bartimaeus was physically blind. But he had greater sight and greater insight and greater vision than everyone else that was there that day. Because no one else was crying out to Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. But this blind beggar, which tells us a lot about Bartimaeus, he couldn't see physically but he could see who Jesus was because his spiritual eyes had been opened. One of the most important prayers the Apostle Paul prays is found in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. And he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be open, that you would know what is the hope of your calling. I pray that your spiritual eyes are open. You know, the most important prayer that you could pray for your unsaved family members and your unsaved loved ones is to pray that the blinders, the blinders, over their eyes, the scales over their eyes would fall to the ground. Why is that an important prayer? Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse uh, 4, the Apostle Paul says that the God of this world, Satan, the God, small case G, the God of this world has blinded the, the, the minds of unbelievers lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel. The whole world has been blinded by Satan. Spiritual blindness is rampant in our world today. You're going to be going to school this week, <clears throat> or you've already started school. So many of your fellow classmates are both spiritually blind and intellectually blind. We don't hate them. We don't judge them. We don't make ourselves to be better than them. But there's some work to be done because their eyes need to be open. You see, in America today, there are so many politicians and religious leaders who are intellectually blind and spiritually blind. As Jesus said, blind leaders leading the blind. Blind leaders leading the blind. You see, how else can you describe, after seeing the video of what's been going on in Planned Parenthood and what they are doing to these little innocent babies and these little innocent children, how can any preacher, how can any politician, how can any fellow uh, citizen in the United States of America defend Planned Parenthood and what they are doing. The only way someone could defend the barbaric, grisly acts that are being committed by Planned Parenthood are those who are both spiritually blind and intellectually blind because the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers lest they see the light of the glorious gospel. And we need to pray, God, open the eyes of our nation. Open the eyes of our political leaders. Open the eyes, God, of our spiritual leaders. And really, it begins with us. Lord, open my eyes that I might see. You know what I love about Bartimaeus? Jesus calls him. He stops. He calls him. They bring him to Jesus. And you know what Bartimaeus was crying out for? He didn't say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, I'm blind. No, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. You see... The real problem in Bartimaeus' life wasn't that he was blind. That was the secondary problem. The
The real problem in Bartimaeus' life was he needed God's mercy because he was a sinner. That's like the rest of us. We're all spiritually blind beggars like Bartimaeus on the side of the road. And what gets the attention of Jesus to come and rescue your life and my life is when we cry out to him, Son of David, have mercy upon me. And then he comes up to Jesus and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? How many know that's a blank check? When, when the creator of the universe, when Almighty God says, what can I do for you? There's a lot of things that would go through my mind at that moment. I mean, forget the fact that I'm blind. What can you do for me? How about creating a whole world and making me the king of that world? That'd be kind of cool. How about that, right? Yeah? I mean, it was like a blank check. You could have asked anything. What do you want me to do for you? He said, that I might have my sight. And I love what Jesus said. He said, it's done. It's done. Just like that. Boom. He could see instantaneously. And Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. How many know when we call unto God, he'll answer us? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. The Bible says ask and you shall receive that your joy might be full. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. And how many know when the Lord says it's done, how many know it's done? And how many know it's not done until he says it's done? See, the world may say you're done, but unless God has said himself you're done, then you're not done. You're just getting ready to, get, to begin. And God can take something that's dead and make it alive again. The world may say, your marriage is done. God says, no, I'm going to give you a new beginning. The world may say, you're done. You're washed up financially, business-wise, emotionally, spiritually, every area of your life. But unless the Lord says it's done, it's not done. But when he says it's done, you can be assured it's done. And all the promises of God have already been yes and amen in Christ. And so that's why we can shout unto God with a voice of triumph who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. And when we go to God in faith and we ask of him in faith according to his word, we know that he hears us. And if he hears us, 1 John chapter 5, we know that we have whatever we have asked of him. And like Jesus said to Bartimaeus, it's done. The Lord is saying to you and I today, it is done. Have faith in my word. And then how's the story end? Well, Bartimaeus is healed, and now he can see. But just before this event happened, he took his coat, he took his garment, and he flung it from himself. That's a detail in the Bible that's there for a very specific reason. What was that coat all about, that he flung it from him, himself? That was a beggar's garment. That was one thing that would identify you that you were a beggar. That was another thing that a beggar would use because he sat there all day early in the morning when it was cool and late in the evening when it got cool. He's saying before he ever had a miracle, before his eyesight was ever given to him, he took that garment that represented his old life and he flung it from him. I love it. Once and for all because he knew he was going to go to Jesus. And once you meet Jesus, nothing will be the same ever again. Can we thank the Lord for that, church? I don't know what garment you have. Paul described it as the old man. Put off the old man. Put on the new man that's being renewed day by day in Christ Jesus. I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you. The story ends with Bartimaeus following Jesus down the road. Lord, I pray that each of us have had our own encounter as Bartimaeus had with Jesus. And that even today, Lord, that we would just, in our heart of hearts, pray this prayer to you saying, Lord, what would you have me do with this message today? Lord, how does this message, pray that prayer to the Lord. Lord, how does this message apply to me? In what area do you want it to apply to my life? Thank you for the help. The help that you can provide us in our hour of need so that in return, we can help others. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you can know his love, his grace, and forgiveness. If you're here today and you need to recommit your life to Christ, then I pray that you would pray this prayer out loud with the rest of us. Say it with your own mouth, mean it from your own heart. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. In Jesus' name, 
Amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together, church family?